I've been hearing a fair amount about being able to talk to the public about energy. So a few years ago with my colleagues, uh, Hugh Crane and Ed Kinderman, we put together this book, which was actually going on for decades. And finally, it's, it's time to put it out. And I'm gonna give you a little bit about it because this is a book to really talk about energy and the need for energy, reframing the debate about energy supply. Um, there are really some tough choices ahead and we need to engage everybody, which means we need to communicate the magnitude and the challenge that is there and face the reality. Uh, simply cheerleading isn't gonna do it. Um, and it's often, right now, it's being framed that we have to, there's a moral imperative to protect the environment. After all, this is the only world we have. And what are we doing? Burning carbon or making the, uh, polluting the atmosphere and climate change and ocean acidification and all those things. We've got to shut those things off. But on the other side, we also have the moral imperative to provide adequate, affordable energy for people to lead healthy, productive lives. But there are many countries where you have doubled the GDP or so, like in the United States, without increasing per capita energy use. And so it is not a uniformly thing that always it goes up, but it depends on where you are. And there are some important lessons buried in there. Uh, but we recognize that our current practice of energy production and consumption is unsustainable, and we have to balance the need for producing enough energy cheaply, cleanly, with the environmental concerns. It is central to the way of our life, and not providing it has some dire consequences. And so there's this tension between protecting the environment and social justice. These are two moral imperatives that are there. And if you want to make a comprehensive energy policy, you must begin by acknowledging the magnitude of the problem. And what does that mean? It means asking questions like, well, how much energy do we use? Where do we get it from? What are the alternatives? What are the trade-offs? Because that's what we are being asked to do. We have to trade off our energy sources. So, good question. How much energy do we use? A lot. Well, first of all, the thing is we get energy not from one source, but many different sources. And each of these comes with its own set of units. So we get a lot of energy from oil, but it's always spoken in gallons or barrels of oil. We get a lot of energy from coal, almost about the same, same amount of energy. Um, I mean, it's always talked about in tons or BTUs. Uh, you use uh, scuffs, which is standard cubic feet of gas, and all electrical systems, we talk about kilowatt hours. This lack of uniform units presents a serious impediment in having or carrying on a meaningful conversation. People glaze over. And the other thing is that all the units, the kilowatts, the hours or uh, standard cubic feet of gas or a gallon or two or barrel of oil by themselves represent a very, very tiny amount of energy when compared to what the global or national needs are. And so you're forced to use mind-numbing multipliers like billions, trillions, quadrillions on top of units that for which we are not accustomed to. We can't form a mental image either. So that was the challenge that uh, my colleague was facing, and he decided at that time, it so happened in 72, uh, that the global consumption of oil was approaching one cubic mile annual, annually, just the oil consumption. And so we said, all right, let's express all sources in cubic mile oil units. And so that's, uh, this next picture shows, in 2006, the global consumption of oil alone cross that milestone of one cubic mile. In 2006, coal provided energy equivalent to 0.8 cubic miles, eight tenths, about two, uh, about two thirds of a cubic mile from natural gas, uh, smaller amounts of nuclear and hydroelectric. Now, um, wind and solar were barely visible at, at this scale, and that was uh, 2006. Uh, well, what has happened in the interim? So the, uh, the numbers that I had, the latest were for 2013, have to do that in 2014. I think the numbers are coming out very soon. Um, so the overall energy use has increased 17% in these seven years. 
Uh, there's been a market, there was a market decline in energy use in 2009 and 2010 following the economic collapse. But by 2011, the world rebounded and was back on the curve of high growth in energy use. Wind and solar increased 270%. Uh, from, there was installed capacity for wind increased fourfold from 74 gigawatts to 320 gigawatts. Installed capacity for photovoltaics increased 14-fold from se about seven gigawatts to 140 gigawatts. But, well, that's more like 20-fold, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you look at the total energy that was available from this, remarkable, it still increased only from 0 0.02 CMO to 0 0.07 CMO. Most of the increase in energy, about the half CMO that uh, the world consumption increased over the seven years, uh, that came from increased coal use, 0.21. Uh, coal use, we, we really like to dump on it a lot, uh, but remember, between 84 and 2005, China lifted 670 million people out of poverty. And that was done on the back of coal, on the back of oil. What was the consequence of not providing the adequate energy to those people at that time? Well, infant mortality rate the globally right now is 17,000 children under the age of five dying every day. I'm not talking year annual numbers, that's daily. It's like the tsunami that uh, occurred in, off the coast of Japan is happening every day, affecting selectively, very, very selectively, children under the age of five. Uh, global CO2 emissions have continued to use from 30 gigatons to 35 gigatons. So that doesn't sound very good. So this is the new picture that of 2013. You can see what the differences have been over there. Uh, coal and oil are now both about one cubic mile of oil. Equivalent natural gas has increased. So um, what drives energy consumption, as I said? If you look at, there's another way of looking at the global energy, and this is by carving up the world in seven different regions. And now I'm looking at not the overall, but I'm, looking, I'm actually looking at both. Uh, on the ordinate, what I'm showing is the per capita consumption. And for per capita consumption, uh, cubic mile oil is not a very good unit, but we can still have a volumetric unit like a gallon so all energy things related to gallon of oil equivalent. In North America, which is the average of Mexico, Canada, and the US, um, average consumption is about 1,800 gallons of oil energy equivalent you know, each year. But the global average is only about 450 gallons of oil. The width of each of these bars relates to the population in that area. So then we have about three and a half billion people um, in the Asia Pacific region, and then also in Sub-Saharan Africa, add another half a million people, half a billion people over there, um, that are surviving on less than 200 or 220 gallons of oil, or even less. Um, so, what does it take if you lift those? people with the, oops, providing enough energy just to become equivalent to global average without changing the population. Just keep the problem a little simpler. That's equal to another seven-tenths of a cubic mile. That's the entire energy consumption in North America. That's the area of that graph, of that bar, the first bar. So it kind of tells us that we cannot just escape simply by conserving way out. We have to get something more than just that. And if you allow that population to get to a level that is about half what's in North America, which is still lower than what's in Western Europe, um, you need another one and a half cubic miles. So our solutions to either produce or through efficiency means avoid the increase in energy use uh, 
those solutions have to scale to the level of something approaching a cubic mile of oil per year. If it doesn't, then we are solving some other problem. And there are other problems. That's not to say there aren't. And so the question is, is economic growth possible without increasing energy use? Can we, can we separate out? And as I alluded to earlier, yes, but only for specific developed countries. There is plenty of room to improve the, or decrease the amount of energy use through efficiency measures and things like that. Uh, but for the rest of the world, at the current state of development, I don't see a way out except by increasing the total energy use. Efficiency is great. When there, when there are particularly wasteful practices, it's one of the first things you should go after. You should definitely do that. Not saying you shouldn't. But remember, historically, efficiency gains have not translated into a decrease in total energy consumption. It has always resulted in an increase. Our refrigerators, are much more efficient today. Our televisions are many, many times more efficient today than they were, say, 20 years ago. But look at the number of screens we have. Look at the size of the refrigerators and look at the total home energy use, electric uh, use that has gone up. So where are we headed? Um, energy use has uh, typically <clears throat> followed this kind of the top growth curve over there, the red line, and as I said, there was, the, so these are just different scenarios, and not predictions. So here we are, 3.5 CMO per year, and we are headed north of 9 CMO per year by 2050, something like that. Um, if we manage to redouble our efforts on with energy efficiency or some other things, et cetera, uh, radically change it, we could drop it to maybe 1.8% per year growth rate, we'll still be looking at above 6 CMO per year. And so where are we going to get that energy? Let's look at, well, I'm going to skip this one. I know you are all nuclear scientists, so you don't need that. We know that nuclear power has a potential. But let me just look at just one slide over here as we'll walk through this one look at different options and say, what does it take to produce even one CMO from any? So my first one was, let's look at hydroelectric dams. Um, well, it depends on the size of the dam. Uh, let's take the world's largest that we have. Let's take the Three Gorges Dam as an example. Well, then we need 200 of those. 200 Three Gorges Dam, and if you want to build these in 50 years, which means you must build one every quarter. Every three months, somewhere in the world, you may have to build a Three Gorges Dam size plant. Um, well, um, I know there aren't those rivers, so that's not the question that I'm answering. And so it just shows the limitation that we have for increasing these large hydro systems. Use it where you have available. I'm not saying don't, but it doesn't get you there. Nuclear power plants. Um, to have a picture of the Diablo Canyon power plant. Let's say one of the units, 900 megawatt electric, uh, with 90% availability. You need 2,500 to get one cubic mile each year. Which well, means every Monday, every Monday from now for the next 50 years, let's have a one 900 megawatt electric power plant. Yes, sir. Is it one cubic mile per year requires 2,500 plants per year, or does it require no. 50 plants per year? You have to build 2,500 plants. If you have 2,500 plants, cumulatively will produce one cubic mile oil of energy each year. Um, remember, when I'm talking about electrical, I am actually uh, not just comparing joules to joules. I'm giving you a lot of... Uh, for any source that gives me electricity directly, every time you give me a kilowatt hour, I say you have displaced 10,000 BTUs, not just 3,412, which is the uh, energy equivalent at the, at the basic level. So energy efficiencies that we gain through s switching the fuels uh, is baked into the, this cubic mile oil uh, way of talking about energies. That's, that's already done in it. So you need 2,500, and if I'm giving myself 50 years to 
get together, get that, uh, come up to speed, then it translates to one every Monday. Well, if I want to go with uh, solar parks, let's look at some one of the largest solar parks. At the time of the book, uh, the largest was actually only a 90 megawatt facility that was in Andesol in southern Spain. And so I said, well, look at that. That's, if I make it 10 times larger, it's the same size as the, one of the nuclear power plants, uh, 900 megawatt systems. Uh, but now the availability is less, uh, so instead of every Monday, I need a new solar park, 10 times the size of Andesol, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, you know, there are, there are, you can do the number, you can do the math. It is pretty daunting. It is pretty, but this is the reality. So if you want to go, um, you know, lifters, great, go for it. But that's the speed at which we need to build them and implement them. So if I were to summarize in three bullet points the 300 pages of the book, it's don't waste, be informed, that means read the book, <laughs> um, and stay up to date, you know, visit the blogs. I do post the, uh, all the updates to the book, etc. the changes as I, as I hear, they're on my blog. And um, please get involved, talk to your friends. And I hope that the language of CMO may help you uh, carry on the conversation a little longer. Okay, so we've got to get nine cubic miles of oil equivalency by 2050. So that's not just the delta S of of six, we also have to replace the three, so it's a total of nine. Okay, and as I read that, we're not on the path from any of these to get one cubic mile out of each of them. Right. So I, I'm assuming then that means that we're making up the rest of that with fossil fuel consumption, and so it's highly likely we'll be producing more CO2 in 2050 than we are today. Do you agree? I do. I am afraid so. Yeah, so I was trying to figure out what a cubic mile would be in thorium. And I think it's about the size of a one-story cottage, 800 square feet. So it's about 20 by 40 by 20 foot cube. So I think it's a pretty small cube. And the fuel, I don't think it's going to be a huge problem if we can do it with thorium. No, it's not. The, the fuel itself isn't very large. Even a, a cubic mile, if you look at the globe, if I were to expand the globe, you know, fill the screen with my high resolution kind of a pixel, you know, the image that I have on my, uh, on my Mac, um, a, a mile is a quarter of a pixel. <laughs> so, it's a, so it's a large and a small, it's both at the same time, and you gotta keep both those images. The thing is, to get the energy out, you still have to develop a lot of infrastructure and plants and put them Something and a lot, an awful lot has to be done, and the consequence of not doing it is what we are facing, living with today. And either we say, "Okay, I'm going to accept that," and do and stand by, or yes, sir. Uh, how many cubic miles of oil do we have left? Yeah, so I do go at length into about this thing in the book. Let me just clarify one thing and. Um, what, what I have been hearing, and maybe you have heard also, for the last 60 years, people have been saying there was about 40 years worth of oil left. Have they been lying to me? No. This is a conflation of the way people talk about reserves. And reserves have a very special meaning. Reserves is what you use accessible today, economically, with today's technology. And also, it depends that only on the current consumption. The consumption has been increasing, so the 40 years should have been, uh, be, been reduced at this high rate of consumption. It hasn't because technology has advanced. And what's the biggest change since 2006 to, say, today in oils? Fracking. Fracking. Oh, that's a small part. That's a small part. Big change is the oil price. It was around, that, around the turn of the century, 2001, 2000. It was, $20, $30 a barrel. Then it shot up to 100 and stabilized about 100 for a while. That allowed a lot of other technologies to come up. 
The frack oil is really a few hundred, you know, couple million barrels a day. That's not something to sneeze at, but the world uses 90 million barrels a day. So it's a, keep it in perspective. The delta is very important, but uh, that's not the big part of it. The big part of it is also a whole bunch of other technology resources that were not available, not accessible at the $20, $30 suddenly become accessible. So the, in 2006, when I wrote the, the, uh, for the book, the numbers, the world reserves were about 42 CMOs, cubic miles. The world reserves today are uh, about 60 cubic miles of oil. And of course, we have consumed seven, eight cubic miles of oil in the interim. But now, below this re uh, the reserves is a very large resource space for which the fuzziness increases because we don't know it as precisely. So there is a lot of oil still there. Is it 1,000 CMO? And you know, even 1,000 CMO, we can burn through that. If we continue on an exponential growth, it doesn't take long. Go humans. No, no, no. <laughs> We're gonna really go. So you know what he looks like. Go and ruin his lunch by asking him this question. I'm here. Thank you very much. Thanks.